Hello, and welcome to episode 50 of The Dive Down, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the casual spike, but goes on the latest decks, trends, and strategies in modern and pioneer. My name is Zach, here in Chicago. With me on the line from Denver, Colorado, he's got a modern deck for every occasion. It's Shane Beeps. Zach, why are you leading the show this week? I'm very surprised to hear you. Well, sometimes I like to spread up my resume, really thicken it out, you know, let people know what shows I have writing credits on and don't. But really, it's because Stan the Man is leading us through a thick dive down today. Oh, man. I didn't even know that. You, wait, 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 what? <laughs> a, a, a week of planning and this is the first you're hearing of it? Well, sometimes I don't pay attention as much. Hmm. Also with us here in Chicago, the man who pivots so much, he was awarded the sharpest turn radius on a mid-range vehicle by J.D. Power & Associates. It's Dave Harberger. Oh, I'm more of a com- I think of myself more of a, a combo crossover than a mid-range, <laughs> but, but I'll take it. <laughs> We had to change the category. There was a car that did beat you in your category. I so. define the category. Oh, interesting. Dave, are you like a eight speed automatic or more like a CVT transmission? Which one is Vanifar pod? <laughs> <laughs> That's a DeLorean. Yeah, I'm exactly. I'm the DeLorean division. Vanifar has like nine gears, right? Mm, I wish. Finally, the man who played 100 decks and lived to tell the tale, Stanislav. You know, all of those decks were based blue red. Some were Just Guy, some were Grixis, but they always had Lightning Bolt and Snapcaster Mage. Any moist jund in there? No. <laughs> if it's moist, I send it back. <laughs> if it has a Tarmogoyf, I send it back. Yeah. On this week's episode, we're breaking down the results from GP Columbus, which had a modern main event. Then we dive into a level up topic, the trials and tribulations of picking up a new deck. Whether you're testing a bunch of strategies in Pioneer or considering a pivot in Modern, we'll discuss some key considerations when you're learning how to play with cards you might not already be experienced with. No wind down this week, but as always, we do have some housekeeping. First up in housekeeping, we want just want to say thank you to the underscore Argus, Jeff S and Christian M for joining our Patreon and joining the Dive Down Nation. And thank you to our friend Joe B for moving up a tier. We really appreciate it. You know, the Argus is a, the name of a song by my favorite band, which is called Ween. And I wonder, I wonder... Did I find another brown friend? You think it might be one? Do you think it might be one of the people from Ween? One of the Ween? Wait, wait, wait. Ween is multiple people. I thought Ween was like a solo project. Isn't the guy's name Ween? No. Well, you're thinking Dean and Gene Ween, but then there's also three other members in the band. No, classic mistake. Yeah, my bad. There's Spleen Ween. No, there is not. Keen Ween. <laughs> not uh. In between Ween. No, you're thinking Mean Ween, who only worked on some of the early records. Ah, I see. I see. He was in Queens of the Stone Age, wasn't he? No, stop trying to merge every 90s grunge band together. (laughs) Anyway, uh, and also thanks to Josh, Eli, JWB, and Jake E for leaving some friendly iTunes reviews. We really appreciate it, and they help people find the show. And uh, if you have some time to go click some stars for us or leave a couple of notes on what you think about the show, we'd really appreciate it. Also, the Dive Down is brought to you in part by Manatraders.com and listeners like you. If you'd like to try out Manatraders for the the best deck rental service, uh, paper or moto, please go to Manatraders.com and use the code THEDIVEDOWN for 15% off your first three months of uh, deck rentals. You know what's really cool about Manatraders right now is a lot of modern decks that were expensive a month ago are now much more affordable at lower tier subscription packages. Are they really? Oh, 100%. Cards that used to be like 50 ticks or more, like Surgical Extraction, are now less than 10. A lot Oof. of the fetch lands have gone down. Pioneer has made modern on MTGO a lot cheaper. Yeah, you're right. I'm looking at like almost every deck, well, about half the decks on the first page of goldfish which indicates like you know this is like the top 14 decks of the format look like they're under 300 tickets so that's like you said that's the first tier of subscription like second tier actually oh yeah you're right like the 30 dollars or so tier dave thanks for that great just information and update and everything and now back to dave with the breakdown absolutely the citizens of modern This weekend descended on a city deep in the heart of the Midwest, despite where Zach thinks the Midwest is this weekend. It's time for us to talk about what is the last modern Grand Prix of 2019, GP Columbus. Everything you thought was correct is now different after GP Columbus. Related to magic or in general? Just in general. Yeah, down is up. 
Up is down. Cleveland is Columbus. Cincinnati is some other place. Dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. Uh, in the context of what's been going on in Magic the, the last few weeks, uh, remember that Modern got missed on the most recent ban and restricted announcement. I think it's a great time to check in on Modern. It's great that we have this last kind of uh, premiere event for the, the year. And um, let's see what happens. Recently, Modern's been a mix of Simic Urza, Eldrazi Tron, Death Shadow, and Titan. Towards the top of the metagame, along with other format sta- staples kind of falling a little bit behind those percentages, but in line from there. Uh, so I um, was really curious to see what would happen as far as if that those percentages would change this weekend. Unfortunately, like many recent GPs, there wasn't any real coverage. Um, back in the spring, it's interesting that uh, Channel Fireball did a couple of test Grand Prix kind of broadcast and then those sort of faded away unfortunately i i guess maybe not enough people watched it definitely felt like a lot of people did um and twitter coverage is kind of rough to follow at least in kind of like play by play round by round stuff kind of goes but fortunately channel fireball was extremely generous in sharing overall meta composition data including tweets that contained the day two meta the day one meta and even a table that included uh the data that allowed us to derive some conversion rates see overall win percentages of most popular archetypes and things like that. It was kind of amazing in that sense because they shared all that data really fast. So I really appreciate that they did that. Um, and I, I think that this is one of those upshots of electronic deck submissions that are just making it easier for them to pull data like this way, way faster than they used to be able to. Too bad we couldn't watch it on video though. And uh, here's hoping that maybe uh, Wizards of the Coast will reconsider some of their Grand Prix um, broadcast policies going into 2020. So the first thing to look at is the day one meta because Channel Fireball actually shared the percentages of the top 10 decks that were registered at Grand Prix Columbus, which is pretty cool. They shared this data towards the end of day one, which is very early uh, and, and really nice of them to do. So at the top of the heap this week was 67 Saltai Wurza decks for 10% of the field. Basically, that lets us know that there were about 660 players in the meta uh, overall as well. So uh, it's interesting, kind of small Grand Prix, unfortunately. I, I, I'm i not sure um, if that's a continuation of a trend or if that's just something because it was so close to Thanksgiving or something like that. But uh, 660 is kind of small for a Grand Prix, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, 660 for a modern GP in like a pretty central area of the Midwest seems pretty low to me, especially because there haven't been like a lot of modern events lately that people could really get to. So that's a little worrisome. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a lot of this is tied into like changes in the organized play uh, structures. And so I think that's kind of pushed the GP attendance down, at least the GP main event attendance down. So maybe that's just what we're seeing. But at any rate, at the top of the heat, this week, with about 10% of the meta, 67 decks was Saltai Warza. Next in line, with 8% of the meta, was Burn. Uh, after that, Grixis Death Shadow, Jund, Eldrazi Tron, and Mono Green Tron all checked in between uh, between 6 and 7% of the meta, roughly. And then below that, the next group was Amulet Titan, Humans, Azorius Control, and Saltai Death Shadow, with all floating right around Uh, 4% of the meta each. So at the top, again, you have Wurza and Burn, and then a group below that, kind of down from there. So let's talk about a few quick hits on day one, right? So we have like Sultai Wurza. Is this kind of just the evolution of Simic Urza or what? It's not. It's just a nomenclature thing that for some reason, Channel Fireball decided to do. They decided to call Simic Urza Saltai Wurza because the sideboard of the main build has things like Assassin's Trophy and Fatal Push and a couple of other spells that are black in it. And so for some reason, they decided to label it that way. But as far as I can tell, it's the same deck. There's no new cards. There's no black cards in the main event of any of the decks that did well. And so, you know, here's what I have to say to CFB is CSB, guys. Thanks for making it more complicated. One of the things that I think we all noticed is that there's a lot of the decks seem like they're just picking up the Wishkarn package, and it seems like they're swapping in those cards over any kind of the Thopter Sword combo pieces or any kind of War of Invention, typically. And I think this is mainly just like a mirror breaker, right? I've been hearing that 
it's just so good against the other artifact decks with a static and it gets you to your win con or another win con that it's just really powerful and worth running. Yeah, totally. That was the first thing that I thought when I saw it too. I mean, you know, it's as good of a mana dump as the combo is, right? Like having Karn up with a bunch of mana and being able to go play Karn and then go get Micah Synth Lattice right away and play it right away as well is, is a pretty good move as well. Also, while you have kind of like cryptic command up the whole time. So it seemed like a kind of natural move for the deck when I looked at it, but it's definitely something that moves the deck farther away from a sort of control combo deck into more of a mid rangey plan. I heard that that was specifically Lotus Box technology that they suggested via their Patreon uh, to help beat the mirror at SCG Envy. So maybe that's where we're seeing it trickle down to. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing this kind of move of Lotus Box technology also moving into the Grand Prix now. And even uh, one of their players made the top eight on Simic Urza as well. One of the problems, though, is that the Karn package can just be really bad against a number of other decks. And this is maybe the turning point of what happened to, is it Phoenix earlier in the year, right? Where we saw it have to cannibalize itself to beat the mirror because it was so popular that, and then it lost some edge against other decks by having to shave things like gut shot and replace it with surgical extraction, for instance, right? So if the deck is having to shore up the mirror because of the sheer popularity of it and then lose percentage points elsewhere, that is kind of an interesting turning point for me. Yeah. I think it's a question of where we're, we're turning or if it's just going to maintain here for a little bit, but I think it's a, a good point. Coming at 8%, we have Burn, which is a little bit of a a surprise, but also maybe a little bit of a perennial second place, always in the shadow sort of deck. I feel like the longer we've had this podcast and the more we've seen the meta grow, the more consistently I've seen Burn just like not win any big tournaments, but just like, yep, people brought Burn. It put up some results. And like, you know, even in this top eight, there were two of them, a little bit of a preview. Yeah. So is it just, is Burn always just going to be a viable deck that's affordable but never the best deck i mean to me it feels kind of cyclical like burn was sort of out of favor for a little bit it doesn't really show up at uh scg events as much it doesn't feel like and then here we are at a gp and suddenly you know 50 people or whatever brought it for day day one all have foil burn yeah exactly everybody's got foil burn because you know columbus is a real burn kind of town the jewel of the midwest baby <laughs> it's a very it's, it's a very it's a very burn meta in central ohio Columbus is the center of Ohio. Eh, well, I like to imagine geography a little differently, but okay. <laughs> You'd I, like to imagine it as being not the center. <laughs> I wonder if something part of that has to do with food actually being less impactful against burn than other life gain spells, because if they're cashing in their food for life, then they're not turning that into threats. And no, it's still bad for what it's worth. Okay. I think burn can just go under it. Yeah, it's one of those things where you have to just play burn differently, right? Like it's it's like against Death Shadow where you don't just drop your hand because then they kill you. Like you, you do have to be aware of an Oko. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean we get we'll talk a little bit about how burn kind of performed across the field, but um, it definitely was represented day one, and people weren't afraid to bring it out in a field that everybody knew was full of Okos. Uh, Sultai Death Shadow is an alter alternate to Grixis or Jund is interesting to see as one of the top ten. Um, and Saltai Death Shadow and Grixis Death Shadow together accounted for around 11% of the day one meta. So if you think about Death Shadow decks, that was kind of the biggest player in the in the room a little bit. If there were some Jund decks to kind of help supplement that as well, it, it might have been the highest registered uh, archetype. Ooh, take a wild guess why it would be Saltai. What, what three mana Planeswalker yeah. would be worth splashing the blue for yeah. out of Jund? Is it Oko the Trickster? It is Alco the Trickster for sure. Um, it basically you're all in on uh, stubborn denial and Oko instead of having access to team or battle rage. This is also I didn't see this deck didn't get to a point where we saw lists. Uh, Channel Fireball dumped the top sixty four right before we got on microphone, so tough to say what's going on there. This is also a deck that occasionally runs a little uh, innocuous card from Modern Horizons called Windcaller Aven as a sort of team or battle rage effect where if you cycle wind collar aven oh yeah, yeah you can yeah. give a creature you have flying and then fly over and dome somebody with your death shadow which is uh seems like an interesting way to go with it but um i i think that there's kind of a whole new 
Oko plus Death Shadow deck kind of happening right now. I believe really quickly, me and Stan both said Windcaller even was a believe because it might go in mono blue living end. I, I don't remember saying that. Well, yeah. I said that and I wanted to maybe lift you up with me, but you can stay down there. So that's what Saltai was up to. Uh, I currently have that deck, a version of that deck sleeved up. And so I'm going to be trying it out over the next couple of weeks. Uh, Etron, Tron, and Amulet all had large parts of the meta. So big mana is still a pillar of the format. Uh, I think that there's no that's no surprise to anybody. And if you look at the way that the the meta game is shaking out right now, to me it feels like there's a lot of mid range with kind of a side of big mana and another side of aggro. So there were kind of 27 percent of the day one meta was mid range. If you count Simic Urza as being mid range, which I certainly do at this point, then Jund and Death Shadows together made 27%. 15.6% of the decks were big mana on day one in the sense of if you look at Amulet, Tron, and Etron as being not the same decks, but similar kind of vibes in the way that they play. Um, and then 12.1% of the meta was aggro or assertive decks like humans and burn. And then finally, 3.7% of the meta was control from what we saw blue white by itself. But Dave, these numbers don't add up to 100. They don't, because there's a whole bunch of other decks that we didn't get to see. This is just looking at the way the top 10 kind of chunks up a little bit more. So if you added these decks together, you get about 60% of the meta between the in the top 10. And so that leaves 40% made of all kinds of other things. Is that is this the smallest we've seen the other category before or no? Uh, I don't think so. We don't usually have access to day one. Uh, sure, the day no, one meta not. in this way and often we kind of see all the day one meta as opposed to just a, a slice of it so um i think that this is kind of normal as far as distribution goes uh the undefeated decks at the end of day one there were two one was humans and one was amulet titan uh so does anybody have any parting thoughts on on day one it's a beautiful day in ohio just another day in modern in ohio so let's move on to day two uh so from what i can tell 119 people made day two and the top 10 decks on day two were Saltai Wurza with 13.5% of the meta, Eldrazi Tron with 10% of the meta, Grixis Death Shadow with 8.5%, Mono Green Tron with 7.5%. Then Burn, Jund, and Humans were all between 5 and 6%. And Saltai Death Shadow, Azorius Control, and Devoted Druid Combo were all around 4%. The decks that we had that gained in meta share from day one going into day two were Urza with added 3% of the meta share. Uh, Eldrazi Tron added 4%. Grixis Death Shadow added 1%. Green Tron added 1%. Humans added 1%. And Druid Combo was the only deck in the top 10 of day two that wasn't in the top 10 of day one. It's pretty interesting to see. I mean, I think that these are the decks that we kind of expected to get a little bit more. At least the, the performance has been going on the last couple of weeks with Eldrazi Tron seeming to be doing well on the meta and Urza seeming to be doing well on the meta. And then essentially Green Tron and Grixis Death Shadow and humans were kind of flat. They only gained 1% going from one day to the next one. The big losers moving from day one to day two were Burn. Burn lost 3% of its meta share and Amulet Titan lost 2% of its meta share. While Jun's Blue Eye Control and Salt Eye Shadow were all kind of flat, like the same, there were the same percentage of players on day two as day one. So we had some good data from CFB shared again during their Twitter discussions, right? They shared a table with a meta composition of like day one, day two, decks that are nine or three and better. And we can derive conversion rates from that tweet. But what's really interesting here is that they shared the overall conversion rates for the event and kind of what they consider a sort of a generic conversion rate what it is and what it should be so in this event they said that about 18.9 percent of people made day two right so there's a little inconsistencies in the counts perhaps from what we can see from this data but let's take what they say at face value right 19 percent of people made day two they mentioned that they think like a generic conversion rate for a specific deck at any event should be like around 15 percent, which is kind of an interesting number to keep in mind so we had some other interesting conversion rates of Simic Urza, Mono Green Tron, Humans, Blue White Control, Sultai Shadow, and Grixis Dash Shadow all had conversion rates over 20%. But the big beefers this weekend seem to be Eldrazi Tron and the Devoted Druid decks, which uh, Etron's conversion rate was more than 35%, and Devoted Druids was 33%. And 
Burn and Titan, like we mentioned before, seemed to be the most registered decks that had the worst conversion rates of 13% and 11% respectively. So that was well below the average of this field. And they seem to like really want to dog Amulet Titan for some reason in their tweets, right? They were like, Amulet Titan sucks. 11% is pretty bad if you if you realize that what the average was this time was 19%. I mean, and it's like half of what it should be. So I don't know. I, th- I think this is some of these things are super interesting in the sense that this is more proof that Eldrazi Tron is, is doing well and, and that kind of stuff. But um, it is a single event that we're dissecting here. So it's hard to put too, too much stock into these as being long-term trends. I mean, Amulet definitely still has recent finishes that are good. So no, it's a little bit of mad money with Zach Callahan right now, because I'm saying buy Eldrazi Tron. I think this is the second best deck in modern, hands down, end segment. Do you think the first one is Urza? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> one runs Oko. So I think the deck that runs Oko is better than the one that doesn't. Mm. In this scenario, just putting it- Eldrazi Tron is really good otherwise, but the value and everything else that Urza and Oko and Troop, Trop, Troop? create together is just more than the Drazi can do, but they come in in a close second place. And I think if something were to ever change in the modern meta, perhaps a card leaves or a few cards leave, perhaps they go on a long vacation. I think Odrazi is positioned to become the number one deck. Yeah. Interesting. So let's take a look at the top eight. I'm going to go in the order of finish. So first is Brian Koval in first place with Saltai Urza. Adam Franzi in second place with Mono Green Tron. Christopher Leutger in third place with Humans. Evan Whitehouse, which is the uh, the Lotus Box player that I had mentioned, kind of alluded to earlier in fourth place with Sultai Urza. Steven Tuchak, fifth place, Humans. Zurich Zhu in sixth place with Burn. Chase Masters in seventh place with, Bur- with Burn. And Griffin Russell in eighth place with Burn. So the really thing, the interesting thing here is that the top eight was four pairs. Two Urza, two Green Tron, two Burn, two Humans. Who needs anything else? Yeah, exactly. There's a there's a healthy metagame for you right there. <laughs> yeah, no, no Eldrazi Tron, right? And no Shadow. Yeah, I mean, I if you had asked me the the week a uh, couple of days before this event, I would have been I was pretty high on Shadow coming into this right now, thinking that it might be able to do some of what it did in Atlanta again. But yeah, no Shadow in the in the top eight even this time. And so what that means is that the final tournament of the year was won by Urza. Mm-hmm. Dun dun dun. But there's a, a two humans. Yeah, it's back. It's back, baby. Technically, eight humans played in the tournament and made to the top eight, but I think I know what you mean. What does Shane know that we don't know? So there's some spicy things outside of in lists that I saw today. So in the Ursa decks, Karn the Great Creator is is the most spicy thing that I saw. We talked about it earlier. I think all these lists are really stock other than that. I mean, I don't know if you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, but there definitely seems to be this kind of week-over-week evolution going on with the Ursa decks. Yep. I think what's interesting, there's some interesting nuance in, I think, both the Green Tron and the Humans decks, especially, in that they're they're shaving their lands down quite a bit. Green Tron used to be like a 19 land kit that was in every deck, and I've seen these decks go down to even like 17 lands. Both of these decks are sort of a conservative 18 right now, and they're both running Emrakul the Promise End main which is not a standard inclusion. You'll see it sometimes, Um, but both of them are running at main, which I thought was interesting, and maybe it just should be something that people are leaning towards or at least testing a little bit more. And as uh, it's also the case with humans in terms of shaving their land count. I've seen some aggressive humans lists shaving down to like 16 or 17 lands. The pilots here were running 18 or 19, which is closer to sort of the stock list, but I think they're sort of edging towards fewer, just trying to be a little bit greedy. So I guess the last thing I wanted to ask you all is that you know we've been trying to do kind of takeaways at the end of our uh breakdown events last week i did not get to be on the show with you all where you talked about sort of the anatomy of a banned card in some ways and so i'd love to just ask you a question here because i don't know if we touched on it really directly last week which is wh- where do you think modern is right now do we need a shake up are we looking good going into 2020 do you have something you'd like to see happen from here and so I'd be curious to hear what you all have to say about that. Shane, why don't you uh, let us know what you think first? 
I mean, I generally think modern is probably fine. If you compare what's happening now to perhaps at the beginning of the year, it's fairly similar. You know, we saw a pretty clear best deck. We saw some decks that were holding their own and then people playing whatever they wanted in terms of like Jund or Humans or something like that. And and going back to what I was saying earlier, kind of about the Phoenix list and the early, beginning part of the year where the Urza decks are starting to sort of cannibalize themselves to fight the mirror that might open up room for other things, perhaps in the metagame. I think that also people are probably focusing on Pioneer a little bit more. It's kind of the fresh new thing. People were waiting for something to experiment in. And I don't think many, as many people are trying to break the modern format really right now. And all I can tell you is that this, this just re-inspires me to play some humans in 2020. I played it at the LGS last week. I had a lot of fun with it again, and I'm just going to be focusing it on myself in card form. So Shane, you mentioned something that I think is interesting, and I don't know if I agree with, which is that the meta right now is reminiscent of what we saw earlier in the year, where you sort of had just the best, the clear best deck that gradually started to cannibalize itself. I, th- I think the difference between what's happening now with Oko and Urza versus what we saw earlier in the year with Phoenix is that Phoenix opened the door for a lot of crazy new strategies in a way that I'm not seeing right now. So, for instance, when Phoenix was dominant, people started playing like Soul Sisters and Esper Control and Ad Nauseum. But now Oko just seems to like beat up on everything and the meta seems to be shrinking a little bit. I don't know if I actually agree with that. But we, we can go back to the tape. I think looking at the the top eight we just saw, where there's actually only four decks and there's two pairs of each deck, I would call that a shrinking meta. That's also a top eight, Zach. Come on. The top eights are where all my data comes from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm in this sort of like weird middle spot where I feel like it's the meta looks kind of diverse, but it's sort of diverse with decks I, I don't totally want to play <laughs> right yeah. now. Yeah, And so I think that this is why I'm starting to double down on wanting to get back into Death Shadow, which is a deck I played, you know, back in 2015, 2016. And I would I think I'd like to to get back into that again. I want to identify one more difference between what Shane compared in terms of today's meta and the meta of earlier this year, which is in early 2019, people weren't sticking a Phoenix in every deck that could support it. As opposed to Oko is just like anyone who's playing Fetchlands is now trying to find a way to stick an Oko in there. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a good point. I'm, I'll be curious to see what happens if that settles down, if it ends up being... Because one one thing that is really cool about Oko or or this particular moment is that Sultai really wasn't like something you could play, right? And so now we have all these decks that suddenly are very good. I mean, it's not really just that Sultai you couldn't be played. It's that really blue-green didn't have any kind of powerhouse, and now looking at it, um, there is some power around that color combination. And so maybe that's a good thing. It's maybe not the card that we thought was going to happen as as turning that deck into a, a real thing. I think a lot of people thought Assassin's Trophy was going to make Sultai a thing. But, um, you know, maybe maybe this will settle down and we'll be able to carve some meta back out over the next couple of months. Um, right now, it does look like there's a lot of Oko everywhere. Although this top eight only had Oko in the um, Simic decks and that was it. Only the Simic decks, you say? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Well, there were only two Simic decks, so it was it wasn't in humans or Burn or or Tron. Well, maybe Burn and Tron should be playing Oko too. I mean, who is that? Who is that player who is playing the like five color Burn deck? Maybe it's we like should two, send them a note. Wasn't on, it just on, Blaze at four twenty or something? Yeah, Blaze at four twenty. <laughs> hey, Blaze at four twenty. If you're out there, put put Oko in your Burn deck. Also, sponsor our podcast. Yeah, please. <laughs> All right, so. Stan and Shane and I have all had a little bit of a moment, but I really put this question in the notes this week because I wanted to hear what Zach has to has to say right now. Are we still banning cards until Sark and Fireblood is playable? Or oh, yeah, no, I think we need a bumper sticker with that, and that can be one of our new merch things: is ban cards until sorry, Sark and Fireblood's playable in Modern. But I just I hate Oko, and Modern is it's fun at my game store. It's fun to play against people, but Oko makes games not games. And when I win against Noko, I rarely feel like it's because I'm a good player. I more feel like it's because my opponent flooded or maybe targeted the wrong card or anything like that. And I, I just don't like it. I'm off prison. I, I feel like you really have to be playing either a go fast aggro deck or an inevitable big mana deck in order to really do good or Dish Shadow, which I think is an aggro deck, actually. But don't at me. But overall, 
I don't know. I think I think Modern will have good things in his future. As I mentioned before in past episodes, I'm not so hot in it right now, but I like Eldrazi Tron. I would not be afraid of Eldrazi Tron big meta. I just do not like that elf walker fey man. Zach, if you're not playing four Phyrexian Revoker, I don't know what to tell you, okay? I'm playing four Pithing Needle and four Zos Respect Class. I'm losing a lot. <laughs> wow, you're probably crushing Jund and Oko and nothing else. Maybe Blue White Control. No, you go O4 still because then they bring in the hate for oh, it. Oh, for sure. Well, I guess that's kind of a wrap for Modern in 2019. We'll certainly be covering it more over the next couple of uh, episodes, but but we'll be, like I mentioned on the, a couple of weeks ago, we'll be focusing on the online meta a lot more given that there aren't really any paper events coming up. And so, um, but that's the end of Premiere. And uh, I'm excited to see what's going to happen in 2020. I mean, I know that people, I think, are a little bit distracted, like Shane said, from Modern right now, but there's still a lot of cool stuff going on here. And I think as we see kind of what innovations continue, especially with you know, Lotus Box focusing on it a little bit. It'll be cool to see what else can happen next. Uh, so we're going to take a short break and then we will be back to dive down into how to pick up a new deck. Stay with us. This week, we're excited to do another topic that was inspired by one of our top tier patrons and an old friend. Shout out to Cool Jake for the great suggestions. Cool Jake was actually our first patron. <gasps> I don't think a lot of people know that, but... Do you mean like he was giving you money illicitly before the podcast began? Yes, he uh, he paid my college tuition, and he, which, Jake. which is extremely cool of Cool Jake. <laughs> I mean, that's how you got the name. Cool Jake traded me one of my collected companies, too, once upon a time. Oh, <gasps> very cool, Jake. If you'd like to have a hand in picking future episode topics for our dive downs, you can also sign up for the double-sided diamond dust tier of our Patreon. And unlike our previous Patreon-picked episodes, Jake sort of challenged us to do a level-up topic instead of a deck dive. And the idea that Jake provided felt like a great way to reflect on our past year in making this podcast. Because over the last 50-ish episodes, we've played with a lot of decks and cards and strategies that sometimes felt foreign or unfamiliar to us as players. And all this testing and exploring led to variable results. Occasionally, we pick up a new deck and kick butt with it. Perhaps a bit more often, we try something new and it would feel like a huge challenge. So in this week's episode, we're going to share some of the skills and lessons we've learned when making the most out of our time and energy learning new decks. Whether you're figuring out what you want to play in Pioneer, or maybe you're even considering a pivot in Modern, we're going to outline tips to get better faster and lose fewer games. So like we usually do on Dive Downs uh, or our, our main topics, I think it's always fun for us to start with some personal anecdotes about kind of like what it's like for the four of us to have to pick up new decks and when we've done it recently given that like stan mentioned we have a, have all had to do it a lot in the last year to make this show what do you like or dislike about having to pick up a new deck why don't we start with the things that we enjoy about picking up a new deck it's always an exciting thing to do and um i'd love to hear a little bit about how that's been for you over the over the last year so I'll start. Before this podcast, I wasn't someone who played a really big variety of decks. I didn't own the mana base needed for Splashing in the Colors, and it was overwhelming for me to consider learning a new style of deck or a new archetype. I really just played mono red mid-range, and that's what I knew and liked. But when I started new testing builds for the show and having to think critically about a deck, it was really rewarding to see what sort of general magic skills or general magic knowledge I had that transferred over. So things like threat evaluation, knowing when to hold up removal, and knowing when to make your opponent have it, things like that, it was really cool to know that my understanding of that from Scred and, you know, from Mono Red Midrange did transfer over to playing Boy Control or playing Shadow in a limited way, but it's cool to see those, oh, I'm kind of good at magic and it's showing here now. It's cool to see like how you progress as a player when you pick up a new deck. It also allows me, I really like playing in new spaces and understanding cards in a more contextualized way. Although I really didn't love playing some of the decks we played in the past, you know, things that are maybe more out of my comfort zone or things that I didn't just enjoy playing. It made me better at knowing how to play against these decks and, and really understanding how to operate against them. So I think a really cool thing in general about playing another deck is seeing things you wouldn't see otherwise and knowing how to react when you see them again in the future. Yeah, I mean, I think that 
a big part of it for me too is a lot like you said, like seeing how the skills that I've learned over the years, you know, when this podcast started, or at least in the immediate period right before this podcast started, I was kind of more focused on limited play than I really was on on modern play. And and part of getting into this podcast was sort of trying to help myself get better at constructed and also kind of apply some of the knowledge I've had over the years of playing magic uh, across broader formats to just this one kind of format that I have a lot of fun with in in modern, but I wanted to get better at it. And so I think that um, seeing how those skills, especially seeing how my kind of combat mathy skills can apply to a format as powerful as modern has been really interesting. I also really love like the improvisational nature of limited. And so picking up a new deck is a little bit like that in, in constructed too, where you're kind of like, oh, I all of a sudden have to figure out what my plan is on the fly because I didn't really practice with this beforehand. I'm just trying this out for the first time and seeing where it goes. So I, I really feel like there's, I gain a bit of an edge playing a new deck sometimes because I do better staying in the moment when I'm playing something that's new than when I'm playing something that I've kind of piloted a bunch of times and I sort of like get very repetitive or rote about the decisions that I'm making. I kind of miss things when I get in a rut like that. It's funny, Dave. I feel like I'll talk about this and I think things we might dislike a little bit is I, I think that I have a hard time staying in the moment with my de- with a new deck um what i do like though is is kind of funny i i've realized that a lot of my engagement with magic is is collecting and i didn't really like realize that for a while and i, I like buying cards i like i like collecting cards i like having like a total 75 together like I love when like I finish the deck list and it's all like organized on my table and I like stack it all up and put it in the deck box. I'm like, oh, this is ready to go. Like I can take this to the to the game store three weeks from now. And you're like putting on your fingerless gloves. Oh yeah, yeah like, like I, I have the, I pull on the power glove and like this this is so bad. Fingerless gloves assist in deck randomization, and I don't want to hear another word about yeah. it. Put it putting on your headbands, getting ready to head down to the dojo. Yeah, yeah. I mean, ultimately, I do like seeing how like a deck actually plays out and how it performs. But uh, honestly, it's almost secondary sometimes. But I mean, I think one of the main things though is I do like learning things, and I like having a reason to learn something new is always good for me. And that's one reason I do like Magic is because it's constantly learning new solutions to like a problem. I'm sort of a mixed bag of a lot of what y'all said, because similar to Zach, for the longest time, I was pretty much just playing various flavors of blue-red because I had these Scalding Tarns and I just didn't want to buy new lands. But like Shane, I also love buying new cards. So my collection of blue-red cards would grow over time such that I would get to this point where I can kind of pivot between a number of different blue-red strategies depending on how I felt or maybe what I was anticipating uh, at the store or what I thought was strong in the meta. But in terms of what I like about trying new decks, a big part of it is learning. And I think there's a certain excitement feeling like maybe this is my chance to tap into something huge and powerful that I just hadn't discovered before. And there's that initial feeling. It's almost like a first date where you kind of have butterflies with this new deck. And it's like, I don't know what's going to happen. This could be the real deal. Could it be love? More often than not, it's a disappointment and life goes on. It has to. The first time you put Oko in a deck, you're like, oh, I think this is going to be it. And, and then you win a tournament with it. So, hey. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it, 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 those are all really great, positive things. Obviously, playing a new deck is, is a commitment and financially and if you really want to get 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 good at it time wise as well to kind of relearn lines and kind of calibrate all the corner cases that there are so i mean i'm trying to to find ways to bring new playing experiences to the card that cards that i have so like instead of hopping around from like archetype to archetype to archetype for the most part before i started the show i would kind of like grow gradually like i was always i started out with jeskai and then i moved to splinter twin and then i moved to kind of grixis from there and then you know, as blue got bad, I built burn and was just kind of like moving around like that. Um, so I think that that's always a way to, to move if you if you have the opportunity to. But, um, you know, it, it is hard to move from from deck to deck in modern, especially with the time and financial commitments. When did blue get bad? Uh, right after Splinter Twin was banned, there was a lot of discussion that blue was just not a very good color. Back in 1957. Yeah. 
So we're talking 20, you know, early 2016. Kind of, there were a lot of people who were kind of like, no, we're not, don't play blue and modern. Snapcaster wow. made just no good, blah, blah, blah. Dark times. They were dark times. It's been a lot better the last 12 months, I'll tell you that. What are some things you guys dislike about trying new decks and, you know, this process that we go through almost, almost every week? So something that I find particularly challenging and dislike about uh, trying new decks is that I mentioned I like when some general magic skills transfer over or my understanding of the game is rewarded. Uh, What I don't like is that getting really good with one strategy or deck doesn't really transfer to other variations of that deck or strategy. So I really like Scred, and then when I played Jund, I thought I was going to crush it, I was going to be amazing, and I walked into episode 33 feeling like a champ. I left feeling like mid-range isn't mid-range isn't mid-range, and that it's actually a whole big umbrella of things, and Magic's a really deep and complex game. And knowing certain interactions or knowing how certain things are can be good. But sometimes you're playing a, a certain deck and you think an interaction's correct or you think you're prioritizing removal correctly, but you're totally wrong because you don't know the play patterns. So I've mentioned this sort of thing where certain decks like Amulet Titan and Tron force you to rewire your magic brain or really relearn the way you think about magic. And I think what I've learned from this podcast overall is every time you pick up a new deck, in some way you are rewiring or sort of reformatting your magic brain. And you are constantly having to relearn, readapt, and maybe something that you thought was true and amazing and great all the time is actually only great in like the burn versus you know control matchup. And in other games, you have to reassess how you spend those resources and those cards. So what I don't like is that magic is such a deep game. I only have so much free time. Totally. I mean, I think that's been a pressure on all of us when making the show is that we have our own goals and what we want to get, get good at as far as modern goes. And then we also want to get good and produce quality content for people. And the, you know, sort of the brand quote unquote that we've built here at the dive down really involves us trying out lots and lots of things to help teach our, our listeners about it. It's not good every episode. I mean, that's like an episode and a half tops. Yeah. That tension is very real for me as well. Because to be honest, I don't love spending time on decks that I don't enjoy playing in paper. Because if it weren't for the dive down, I think I'd only ever play the decks that I get to shuffle with my bare hands. You guys have sort of mentioned this, but it takes a while to get good at a deck. Years. Sometimes years, yeah. And uh, figure out what a deck is doing. So when I try something new that I know I'm only playing for a short period of time, I'm basically committing to losing for science. And generally, the science is worth it. But I think most people would agree that it's less fun than winning. It's pretty humbling, though. Like, I think I've talked about a couple times, and we even talked a month or so ago about, like, the learning process um, kind of having a real cost as far as the the kind of me feeling like I was in a rut and not sure what deck I was supposed to be playing anymore when I was spending a lot of time rotating from deck to deck to deck. I mean, I think it's the knowledge that I've gained over the last year, just as far as learning, you know, feeling good on the flip side of an Eldrazi Tron matchup now where I know what their plan is. I know what they're trying to do. I have a better idea about whatever deck I have in my hand uh, can do to disrupt them because I know how that deck works. And then there's infinite examples from from their back, from all the decks that we've had to dive on. That knowledge is kind of hard won and worth it, but it can be, uh, it's tough and it's taken a while to get there. So it's kind of a like and dislike in some ways. For sure. I, I think I agree with you in a lot of ways, Stan. It's like, I don't get a chance to play a ton every week myself. So learning can be hard. Like I feel stupid when I make an obvious mistake that was on board because I like didn't read a card correctly or I forgot something or I was sort of autopiloting or letting myself be distracted and not really being engaged with the game. And that's on me, but I think that's just, I think that happens to a lot of people who are experiencing new cards. I mean, I was just hearing people's experience at the invitational where they were saying, I think it was the grindcast guys were saying, yeah, I've had people miss what stone coil serpent could do all the time. Like, you know, one time they didn't realize it had reach and then they didn't realize that a protection from multicolor in the same turn. Yeah. Huh. Brutal. And so th- these are good players. Yeah. I think it's funny, Shane, that you and I seem to have like opposite problems where like I pay more attention when the situation I'm in is new. And it sounds a little bit like you sort of maybe rush through a little bit when the situation is new or like 
Yeah, I think a lot of it is just sort of, yeah, just rushing in general, or if I'm feeling like behind on the clock, like if I'm playing a slower mid range deck where on Magic Online or even in paper, where I'm just sort of like feeling the pressure of the clock, I'll play fast and loose. And with a mid range deck where you have to eke out max value, you're not going to get there. So I, I think I just feel increased pressure or I get lazy, one of the two. Yeah. So it is like an emotional experience to have to, to, to pick up a new deck. And so I can understand why. Um, you know, it's hard for people to decide to do it or uh, hard for people to want to go through that process a bunch of times. Um, on the flip side, I really enjoy it in the sense of just being feeling like the experience is always novel. You won an award for it from an astute accrediting body. I did. Judy Power and Associates. Yeah, the power to pivot. That's my um, that's my 2020 uh, campaign slogan. The power to pivot? Uh, the power to pivot, yeah. Oh, look, Harburger? Yeah. Harburger for... Oh, I didn't say elect. Office? It's just a... It's just a campaign. Yeah, well, I'm I'm sort of putting your name in the ballot. Okay. It's a little bit of a Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire type deal. So I think the next thing for us to talk about here is what do we do when we pick up a new deck? And you know whether that's resources or other ways that we learn about the deck before we start playing it, I think it's really important to think about the kind of way that you begin learning about what you're, what you're about to do. So Zach, I, I know that you had some thoughts here to start with. Yeah, so like I mentioned, I was someone who didn't really play a lot of other decks before this podcast, so I really had to figure out a method for me to look at a deck and figure out what is this deck doing, how is it operating. So literally, I am asking myself when I look at a deck, how is this deck winning? Is it winning through combat damage? Is it winning through some sort of big combo? Is it winning through some sort of inevitability engine where it makes a bunch of XXs forever? When is it winning? Also important. Are you a deck that is trying to execute this plan on turn four? Are you a deck that's trying to grind out your opponent and then go, oh, on turn 10, you're totally out and I win now. And then really important to me is, what is it doing on every turn leading up to when it wins? And that's something that I really try to learn from Scred, because on Scred, ideally on turn two, you're tapping out for Mind Stone, which is a weird play for a lot of decks to make, but it's really pivotal for that. So I try to extrapolate that and say, I'm sure every deck has this sort of weird turn two Mind Stone-esque play, and I need to learn what that is along the way to make sure that the deck is operating correctly and that I'm greasing the wheels along the way to get to my turn X conclusion that I'm aiming for. Zach, I think this is incredibly important what you're mentioning here right is how is the deck winning and how is it doing so along the course of the game right that's just the fundamental thing is is what is the deck's plan is kind of another way to phrase that and what are the stages of that plan because it's not like you just sort of get to the end result without steps along the way because magic as a game has so many different phases even in such a short sequence as modern like modern you know people call it a turn four format which is sometimes an exaggeration but sometimes it's not right so it's really important to look at something like for example how many one drops is the deck running are these are one drops that you're trying to play very quickly are they mana dorks are they drawing cards are they haste creatures i'm not trying to offer heuristics or like you know if a card is four mana dorks you're doing this or if a card is five hasters you're doing this but more in general you want to have an idea of a deck that is has this many cards that do this is probably on this sort of game plan or a deck that has this sort of, you know, removal play pattern. It wants to do this and it can be hard. For example, a deck like ad nauseum, if you're not pretty enfranchised, it's very hard to figure out how that deck does what it does and how it actually wins. But in general, being understand the variety of decks that exist and even decks within a, you know, subfolder like combo is really important and will help you grow as a player. I really find tournament reports that people write to be helpful for me personally. And when we were playing new decks, I would look for someone that said, hey, I played nine rounds at a PTQ. Here's what I did. Because even if some of it was over my head or a little esoteric, you would find little nuggets there and little plays they made that would be useful for, you know, getting a look into the deck and maybe repeatable in your own play. So I think that that point about trying to figure out what turns are leading up to the, the deck's plan uh, what those are is really important, but my really qu my real question is kind of how do you do that, and what do you do to try to get that knowledge when you're when you're starting? Because it's not like it comes out of thin air, and so I think Zach bringing up tournament reports is really interesting. And so I'm wondering what what you all the the other the rest of the hosts do as far as that goes. Yeah, I'll give you all a little peek behind the curtain, kind of what I do when I'm starting up a, a deck dive down right, which is I look for more authoritative and sort of collective intelligence versions of like a deck guide like written by a hive mind 
Like, yeah, like, well, essentially, like MTG salvation threads, right? I put this deck into a machine learning algorithm and this script came out. They ran, oh, Shane wants the simulations. They ran the simulations. Yeah, he just wants the simulations, right? It's always ever wanted. Shane's a robot. Well, what I value really highly is is collective group thinking that leads to more collective output, which is one reason why something like the MTG Goldfish guides to a deck where they say like, 85% of a deck will have a four of or 61% of a deck will have this two of like it sort of shows what the the group think is on a, on a deck and where kind of a deck is, is going or has come from. I think the MTG salvation threads that still do exist, thankfully, like the, the primers about a deck that have like a history and a description of why a card's in a deck is super important. Kind of learning what the power of each individual card is, is super important. Because that lets you understand, rather than just looking at the list, you're saying, okay, people who play this deck say they like to use the card in this fashion, or it's really valuable against this certain matchup, or you bring it in from the sideboard because of this reason, or against these types of decks. And I think when, that's kind of like a, just a shortcut to, to get to some really good information that would take you a while to digest if you're not as experienced as a lot of pros. So it's so interesting to me that that's kind of your approach. And I kind of suspected that you and I would have a a different kind of take on how this works, because honestly, what I do when I pick up a deck for the first time is I read the deck list a couple of times, try to ask myself a few, kind of think about a few key questions that I think will come up when I play the deck. And then I just start playing the deck. And I, I don't, I have a really hard time with digesting all the resources that are out there as on like deck writing in in the world of magic there's so much content about every deck and like every deck has its own discord these days and i feel like that stuff is such like advanced level learning that when i'm just starting out with a deck what i really need to do is try to figure out how i'm going to get it to win at first and kind of check my own assumptions and then i think once i've played the deck for a while and i've decided that i'm committed to wanting to keep getting better at it then i want to go back and get that that learning to kind of tune up some of the assumptions that i've made so far for listeners to where money is not an object, consider printing out a enormous copy of your deck list and taping it to your ceiling, perhaps in sort of a wall cling style. Look at it, memorize it before bedtime. My approach is kind of similar to Dave's and I mean, not unlike having a list on my ceiling because I think for me, reading a deck list a couple times and trying to figure out on a surface level what it does is step one and then step two, I just dive in. Because similarly, unless I really care about getting good at something, I just have no patience for articles or sideboard guides or the discords. And I'd really rather just learn by doing trial by fire. Uh, And I'm a big fan of the MTGO practice rooms for that reason. And like sometimes when I just have time to kill, I'll just load up a deck on MTGO and just run it through the practice rooms, do unmatch and then move on and do something else. Just because I think getting like even a little bit of exposure and a little bit of practice seeing what the draws are like, what the cards are trying to do helps me a lot in just answering some of those initial questions. Yeah, I'm way more interested in reading magic articles that are about kind of general level up topics that help me dial in my fundamental understanding of like the principles of magic, right? Like what is card advantage? Like where is card advantage good? Like what's the right way to attack? Like how many resources can I put into attacking? Like a combo deck, how much of my of my deck is made up in making the combo happen versus disruption and things like that. I feel like that stuff is way more compelling to me generally and then when i get really into a deck then i want to engage with uh, the the kind of tune-up side of it and that's what helps me really gain the knowledge of the plan yeah i think i'm skipping a step honestly and stan you mentioning the practice rooms is something that i overlook a lot because i i frequently look at at mitgo as like oh here's a two and a half hour time investment and like and that and that makes me less apt to just like jump in and jam a match, which I think is very feasible to do, especially with like a deck rental service. Um, you can you know rent your deck, go play a, a game or two in the practice rooms, jump back out, get your cards back. You know you're you spend an hour and you got some good experience that then prepares you for that league that you want to play later, perhaps. Yeah, I've switched to that recently too, kind of inspired by Stan. I used to just immediately jump into a league. 
constantly just be like, yeah, sure. 2 yes, a.m. Just like, I'm just going to play a league all the way through and see, see what happens. And then get frustrated with when I won four because I lost the first match because I forgot what a really key card did. So now I like to at least play a few practice matches before I forget what a key card does in a league. So I think it's interesting to hear all these kind of different methods that we have for gaining the knowledge of what the plan is and putting that into action. But the hard thing really is, you know, I think the four of us have expressed different ways of learning about a new deck. But the thing that's really cool is that, like Zach said at the very beginning of this whole segment, there really is one goal. And that goal is trying to figure out how to capture and understand a deck's plan in detail across the time that you have to play it. To play the deck meaning within a game like what's the beginning of a of a d- deck's game plan look like what's its mid game look like and what's its late game look like and i think one thing that's really interesting about this is that we often look at uh when we're pre- preparing a dive down like shane said you know there's kind of three components that go into that description of what a, a deck's plan is supposed to be and one is the cards what's in the deck and why the gameplay itself at a detailed level, like trying to plan that out and communicate that to our to our um, listeners. And then finally, what's the deck's position in the in the meta and how it relates to other decks and things that you should know about uh, the tools that are in your deck and what they're available and what they're for. They map so closely to the way that we put together deck dive episodes that I think it's really interesting that really the we talk about picking up new decks on this show all the time. It's just, we talk about them specifically and not really in the abstract like we are today. Yeah. And when people talk about decks in the abstract, one of the concepts that always comes up first is the concept of your plan, which is a shapeless amorphous idea that can differ from one deck to the other beyond both space and time. Yeah, totally. And and understanding the difference between your deck's plan and what the cards just kind of do at face value, I think is a big level up topic for a lot of players across formats. So planning is the first thing that we're going to talk about in this dive down. And one of my favorite places to start in terms of figuring out a deck's plan is really understanding what it's trying to do with its mana and the type of lands you want to get so that you're never tripping over yourself because sometimes the decisions you make with lands and mana in turn one will affect everything else that happens in the game especially in those very crucial first few turns so for instance if you're playing a greedy deck something that's three or more colors what type of fetching sequences give you the most mana on every turn or give you access to the most cards in your deck Something like Grixis Shadow and Jund, I think, are great examples of this. You almost always want a black source on turn one, so you could do like a turn one Thoughtseize or Inquisition. Jund will sometimes play um, a man land or creature land on turn one. But if you're in a mid-range deck, you want to have access to black mana, but if you're fetching for it, what's that secondary color that you're trying to get as well? Also worth noting, this can apply to monocolor decks if you have non-basic lands and multiple mana symbols. For instance, I play decks with a lot of Idol on the Great Revel, and you need to know if you have that card that you want to red on turn two. So if you are seeing a hand that can only make one red on turn two, you might want to ship it back and just be aware of what the mana needs are for the deck and be aware of how much mana you need to have or what colors of what mana you need to have early game. I think you can apply this to big mana strategies as well. You know, big mana decks are always about getting to a specific payoff. If it's Tron, it's getting turn three Karn. If it's something like Amulet, it's getting a Primeval Titan as early as possible. And sometimes figuring out that plan and that path to your big mana payoff begins on turn one and the lands you sequence or the cards you're playing to get to those resources. Yeah, you'll notice a lot during our deck dives, we'll talk about the importance of sequencing. We'll talk about the importance of your keeps having a plan that's getting you to your early payoffs. Like in our mono green Tron episode, we're talking about how the, essentially the entire plan of the deck is make Tron, make Tron, make Tron. When we talk about things like humans or spirits, we're talking about, well, do you play that Aether Vial turn one? Do you play that noble hierarch turn one? Or do you play your, you know, your disruptive single blue mana spirit whose name is escaping me right now. Mausoleum Wanderer. Yeah. It's like, so, there's a lot of special sailor. 
Yeah. Am I trying to set myself up to play two dro- two two drops on turn four, or am I trying to set myself up to collect a company on turn four? Like, it's kind of like different ways to think about that for sure. Yeah, the game is compressed in modern more than other formats. So your se- your sequencing and your decisions from the mulligan on are more important as well. One final thought on mana for me. Make sure that your lands come into play untapped when you need them to come into play untapped. And this is a mistake I made when picking up a deck like Jund and not being aware of when to play a fast land versus a check land and just sort of being mindless. And then going Bloodbraid Elf, turn four, sick. Oh, this land comes into play tapped now. I totally messed up. I'm going to lose this game. So just making sure, like, like Stan led off with this, it's really important. Your mana base is the most fundamental part of your magic deck. Make sure you utilize it correctly. And the reason it's so fundamental is because these are the resources that we're using to pay for every other card we're going to play. And sometimes figuring out what you're doing with those resources even amounts to having ways to sink excess mana or ditch excess lands. You know, maybe you're playing something like Royal Scions, or maybe you're playing something like Walking Ballista or Scooter Looter, whatever that thing is called. Smuggler's Copter. One day we'll figure out what that card is called. Figuring out what your resources are doing for you at almost every step of the game, but especially on the first couple turns, I think is going to be a key to getting wins that sometimes you might lose because of mistakes or unforced errors that you make. So speaking of those early turns, let's talk about turn one. I think turn one is, it seems like a little bit more relevant and modern, but Pioneer is quickly becoming an aggressive format where your turn one plays matter a big deal. So whenever you pick up a new deck, I think it's pretty important to ask yourself, what is your ideal turn one play? Is it Llanowar Elves? Is it Thoughtseize? Or is it a tapped land that'll give you better mana for your bigger payoffs on turns two onward? Likewise, do you have a good reason to play a deck that doesn't do anything on turn one? Whether you're in Modern or Pioneer and you're dealing with, you know, Elves or really aggressive strategies, if you're not keeping up with the speed of the format, I think you have to be able to explain to yourself and and to anyone you're talking to why your deck is doing that and what you're gaining as a result of that decision. One of the things that I look for in terms of setting up my early game plan is thinking about what cards are meant to be cast early on, right? Like, do I have Aether Vial in this deck? Do I have Thoughtseize in this deck? Do I have Mana Ramp in this deck? And saying, if I don't have these in my opening hand, it's likely not the kind of opening hand that is on plan for this deck. You know, is uh, Amulet Titan, for instance, right? The entire deck is deemed after Amulet of Vigor. And Primeval Titan hangs out there to, to, to do some stuff as well. But this is really an a, a de- a amulet deck, by and large. I like to imagine they own the amulet. <laughs> Hold on, what? Like a pendant they wear around their neck or having a satchel. Oh, Okay. So those are the kind of things that I look at a lot because those are kind of the engines of the deck and you want to get that engine online as soon as possible. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to have a clear-eyed view of how important it is to mulligan to the ideal turn one play because it really varies a lot from deck to deck, right? In Jund, you know, you like having thought seize on turn one. You don't have to. Is it worth mulliganing to lose a card to get to Thoughtseize when you also can have a draw that has Bolt into Tarmogoyf and maybe that's okay in your matchup. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you're playing a deck like Mono Red Prowess used to be, you kind of had to ship any hand that didn't have one of the one drops in it, either Soulscar Mage or a Monastery Swift Spear, because if you're not attacking on turn one or attacking on turn two, you're pretty much dead playing that deck because it's only asset that it had was speed, right? And so you really have to have a good idea of not just what those plays are, but how essential it is for you to play them and how worth it is to trade resources to have them on turn one. Yeah, and likewise, how much worse are they later in the game? Like a top deck Amulet of Vigor on turns four or five feels pretty bad. But you know what I think is the most important turn after turn one? I think it's turn two. Was that turn three? Nah, dog. Turn two. Turn two is when Tarmogoyf happens. Turn two is when Gurmog Angler happens. Sometimes you get to hold up a counter spell. Sometimes you already get to ramp into a three CMC walker that rhymes with Joko. Sometimes thing in the ice. Yeah, I actually think it might be hard to say in modern that turn two is the early game. Unfortunately, <laughs> you know what I mean? 
it's like turn zero and turn one are the early game and turn two is already the mid game because people are playing three drops. People are starting to combo off on you sometimes on turn two. There's there's stuff, real stuff happening on turn two. You know, even in, in Jund, you can play uh, four or five on turn two in, in Tarmogoyf because of the way that people's um, the way that people's graveyards have turned out. So it's really kind of interesting that it's, it's borderline, right? Like sometimes it's a setup term for some decks and for other decks, it's really full on. Like my plan is developing on turn two. Yeah. And, and I think we talked about turns one and two differently than any other point in the game because on turn two, so many strategies are already laying out their main threat, you know, whether it's, Gurmog Angler or Tarmogoyf or something else. And asking yourself, what am I trying to do on turn two, I think is really important across all formats, um, especially Pioneer and Modern, when you have such powerful cards that you can either ramp into or you just have access to such a wide pool of cards that, you know, the strongest cream raises to the top. Sure. Turns one and two are okay. What about turns three through five? Real mid-range hours. This is Zach's time, baby. <laughs> yes, this is the real Zach hours. Zach was born on turn three. <laughs> I I think that I um I think I was born a turn three cough, and that is you know what really what it is. I'm a cancer baby. So in the mid game, turns three to five. What I'm thinking right now, and what you should be thinking is, what's your path to victory? So are you a protect the queen deck where you are landing a Gurmag Inkler Death Shadow and going, this is gonna live the rest of the game. I hope you know that by protecting with counter spells and removing their threats. Or are you playing powerful two for ones like Jun and Scred is, where you're playing a Planeswalker and upticking or playing a Colgon's Command and just really getting there? Or once again, like other mid range decks, are you disrupting? Are you really making sure that your opponent's boat is removed so you can then land your threat and totally get away with it? Thinking about what are you hoping to draw off the top? Are you hoping to draw the final part of your curve that rewards all your disruption, rewards all your interaction? Are you hoping to draw another removal spell to finally get rid of that last blocker to get through with your attacker? During these terms, it's really important to know what you want and what you would do based on depending on what you got. So maybe you're thinking, okay, if I get a removal spell, I can take care of that and attack. If I get a draw spell, I'm going to hold it until this last minute. If I get a walker, I got to slam it, etc. This is a point of the game where you have possibly very few moves left. So these moves require a lot of forethought ahead. So when you're here, you really need to know what your win con is and how you're going to get to it. But some decks go beyond turn five, I hear. Yeah, I think that turns three to five is, is also the spot where if you are a disruptive deck, you need to understand the plan that your opponent is trying to execute and how to Absolutely. stop it right now. So if you're someone who relies on any kind of interaction as part of something, this is these are the turns you have to survive. Right. Whereas somebody who's attacking again, like a burn deck or something like that, these are the de these are the turns where they're trying to win. Totally, Dave. And to add on to what you're saying and to clarify a thing that I think we all agree upon, but really should speak at this point in the game, you have to know what your opponent is playing or have to at least commit to thinking they're on this and fighting that strategy in a certain way. So usually, you know, if you're, you've played enough, you can know uh, a fetch into a certain shock or a shock on tap can mean a thing. But on turns three and five, you need to know how you are getting there. And that relies on some level of understanding or guessing or hoping that your opponent is on a deck you understand or are on a plan you have a way against. Something Zach touched on briefly that I want to elaborate on a little bit more is knowing what you want to draw in these turns because unless you're playing blue or ancient stirrings you don't get to dig through your deck very much and a lot of decks will sometimes only see like 10 to 15 cards including their opening hand so you sculpt your plan your early game plan from your opening hand but then what you're drawing in turns two through five can sometimes be the difference between winning and losing so whether you can manipulate what you draw or whether you can just force it with your mind your mind's desire i think having a clear plan based on what you need to pick up off the top is going to be a great way for you to forge your strategy whether it's disruptive whether it's aggressive yeah i mean i think stan what you're talking about a little bit here is what's known as playing to your outs where you know so it's not always just about what card you could draw off the top to save you. It's also making sure that the card you draw off the top can save you, right? So it's thinking about 
maybe trading a blocker or thinking about using a removal spell for one thing that seems a little bit off because it opens you up to a situation where the cards that you potentially could draw off the top can be effective. That's the thing that you have to make sure that you're doing is laying the groundwork for the cards you draw. You could draw to be good. It's not just relying on them to be good on their own. Dave, this was a huge level up moment for me personally that I had while we were making this podcast, you know, some six months ago where I used to go, okay, I need a hazard or I lose here. Uh, Bolt, I don't get there. And it's like, okay, well, hold up, buddy. What can Bolt do? Like, you didn't get the card you wanted, but now you're not just done. Like, think about how you can use the card you drew and how it's going to interact. And this whole sort of thing of you can't wish the card you want to the top. You really have to understand what's going to be there and how to best utilize what is most likely to be there and what is going to be there. Yeah, and I would even describe put an even finer point on that, which is kind of like what you want to do is figure out how to craft the situation that you can control so that both Bolt and Hazaret are good. So you don't want to just sit there and go, gosh, I need Hazaret in order to win. What you want to do is go, what else is left in here? Is there some resource that I can give away so that I move my opponent into a spot where also Bolt becomes a card that helps me win in addition to Hazaret or a couple of pieces like that? So it just widens the possibilities of what comes out of your deck. And this is where, like, in Modern in particular, you know, the moves are really subtle in here, right? Like, sometimes it's like, I decided not to bolt your Bird of Paradise. Wow, that's a really non-standard play pattern. But um, I did it because I wanted to make sure that I had enough bolts for you, basically. So there's just this kind of tension there where this is where you'll find people doing things that are off script and either they work out or they don't work out. But this is where you need to be thinking about things that are surprising plays. Yeah, I think when we're talking about playing to your outs, I start thinking about kind of the the late game in modern, right? And there's not every deck has this the same late game at all. And so that's when you start looking at, do we have things like mana sinks? Do am I am I planning on winning with walking ballista that I'm recharging every turn and then pinging my opponent or pinging their board down? Am I going to be using things like uh, Urza's five mana ability to to get through my deck? Am I going to plan on using things like the castles or something like that? Really, what you're looking at is how are you closing out the game with the cards that you have in your deck and using your mid game plan to then finish the opponent off. And really, I think what's very important here is how are you preventing your opponent from winning if you're ahead? How are you not opening the door by making a mistake to let your opponent have get a step through and you know show their face in a very creeping, shining sort of way? Yeah, I feel like at this stage in the game is where I and like sometimes even streamers that I watch will ask themselves or tell themselves like, this has become my game to lose. Like I have all these resources. I have all these options. What am I doing with my mana every turn? Or what am I doing with the cards on the board to make sure that my opponent doesn't get ahead here or to make sure that I don't fall too far behind? Or how do I break the stalemate? And what happens when you do get in a stalemate? I scoop and I walk away. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's, it's important for you to have an understanding, you know, are you a small creature deck that needs to keep going wide and go around what your opponent's doing? Are you a mid-range-ish creature deck that's keeping the board clear, saving your removal for important things that your creatures aren't bigger than, and then ensuring that you can get that damage through to your opponent? Are you trying to play around some counter spells and sandbag a bunch of burn so that you can overwhelm your opponent's mana and the cards they have in hand that cost more than your spells. So that's kind of like, there's a lot of different ways that an end game may look and you have to kind of understand what is your deck's end game. So let's talk about your deck because there's a lot of fun ones out there. Modern has, I think at least four decks. Pioneer has a few more than that. Five if you count Scred. Scred's and Pioneer. In a way. I think one of the most important things people should start asking themselves when they decide to try a new strategy or when something catches their attention is figure out what's the most broken thing your deck is trying to do. Because whether you like playing really fair games or whether you like playing big mana ramp decks, you're in an environment where people are playing super powerful broken cards and strategies that if you're not keeping up with the power level around you, you're just going to get run over. 
I think so many of us have been in experience where we go in with like a tier or meta deck to the LGS and we play against someone who it's their first time playing modern and you just run them over because they're just casting cards and they're not necessarily thinking about the power level of the format. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things that's awesome about modern and also kind of terrible about modern is that you do have to re rewire your brain quite a bit from the way that you originally learned how to play magic to realize that this format is all about super powerful big swinging plays executing plans so with in such a focused way that nobody can stop you or really powerful decks that are just great at stopping plans and so other than that it's really tough to kind of do something that's sort of like fair magic in the sense of i'm just going to play creatures and attack with them so I think some of the ways or some of the questions you can ask yourself to determine what the most broken thing you can do is includes figuring out whether your deck exists because certain cards are particularly good. So maybe you're in a meta where an infinite combo is powerful and you can do storm things because no one's playing hand disruption. Maybe you're in a meta where people are playing super fair and then you get to play K command or a different command or powerful planeswalkers and you can two for one your opponents and that's where you get a powerful edge. Sometimes you get synergistic disruptive creatures like humans or super fast kills because you're playing burn. Figuring out what gives your deck that powerful edge and why it even exists in the meta in the first place, I think is one of the most important things you should do before you really even take the deck out and play with it. Likewise, does the deck get to exploit a certain zone of play? You know, we were talking about Graveyard Masters when Ultimate Masters came out. And I think that's because people were starting to acknowledge that Modern was becoming a very heavily graveyard-centered format. And that's changed quite a bit. But there are still decks that exist that exploit a zone of play better than others. Crab, Vine, and Dredge still do that with the graveyard. I think Teferi Time Raveler is a good example of forcing your opponents to play at sorcery speed, basically giving you the opportunity to monopolize instant speed windows. One of the other broken strategies that decks have access to that I don't think people necessarily acknowledge as broken or powerful is redundancy. So when I was playing Devoted Druid for our Oko episode, one of the things that really stuck out to me was that deck has a lot of tutor effects. If the deck goes long enough, I'm always going to either find the creature that combos off or find the card that will let me find that creature. Is it Phoenix players in Pioneer and formerly in Modern had the same privilege where half of your deck is just meant to draw cards, you know, and, and being able to do that over and over and find the right payoff for that is what gives that deck legs. Such a dream to me. I'm just thinking about drawing cards now. God, drawing cards is the best. You don't need more than 20 cards in your library when the game is over, Dave. No, you, you know what I you know what I like doing is I, I like dredging cards into my graveyard. That's a lot like drawing not cards. Not the same. Not the same. You're you're playing humans now. Just stop talking about dredge. <laughs> I, I like drawing cards through my my uh my horizon lands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my favorite thing to do is psycho horizon canopy. <laughs> <laughs> Stan, I I like what you mentioned about just thinking why your deck exists in the first place because modern is such a high power format that you're not just playing a pile of cards typically you're 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 leveraging a very powerful key card a combination of cards and by understanding what your deck is doing that no other deck can do as well as yours and why it's seeing play at all is going to give you a base of information from which to operate from. I totally lived this recently where I took Grixis Shadow to my LGS because I thought Stubborn Denial was going to be great. And I was talking to friend of the show, Dr. Martin Sheeler, shout outs, who was telling me basically like the deck only exists because Stubborn Denial is so good right now. And that got me thinking about a period a few months ago when I first built Grixis Shadow and humans was quite a bit more popular. And I took it to the LGS and I just got stomped by humans decks because they were able to get around my single threat and they didn't care about stubborn denial. And the meta has shifted in such a way that now this one card is so good and this one deck is really good at casting it. So is stubborn denial the only reason to play Grixis Shadow? I don't think so, but it's one great reason to play this specific deck. I think another thing too, that's important to mention on that topic is you know 
combo decks or two card combos and synergies that can exist within a deck, right? So even if you're not a straight up combo deck, a lot of the decks that you will play or look at will have key synergies or card synergies that exist, right? So you might have things like in humans, because I'm back on that, is you have your kite sail free witter to look at your opponent's hand and strip something out of it. And then you have your meddling mage to back it up. So you see what they might be casting in the future. You take them off that by naming it with meddling mage. You have your is it charm and fiery temper in, in pioneer, especially where you cast your is it charm or any of your discard spells. You're able to pitch that fiery temper and get the advantage of the cheaper casting cost for off the madness trigger. Yeah, I was playing in Soul. Is it in Soul and Pioneer? And in Soul Artifact plus Dark Steel Citadel, it straight up wins games almost in a way that a combo deck would win games just because that two card synergy is so powerful. When you're seeing people run Unravel the Aether in their green sideboards, you know that Dark Steel Citadel suited up with an uh, Soul Artifact as, an, as a legit threat. <laughs> you mean they're not worried about Thassa? <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk about the God of the Sea so casually, Dave. I know. She's stormy. We talked about a really awesome synergy just like a couple episodes ago on Spirits, which was Drog Skull Captain and Drog Skull Captain. And things like that, they might not even seem obvious at first. But if you're not aware of these little opportunities that your deck has, and your deck has them hiding in the 75, I think you could potentially be leaving wins on the table. And I think to go back to the kind of like mapping stuff or along game phases... This kind of stuff is super important to know in the the mid game because it lets you know how you're crafting your game going into the late game. So if you know, hey, I really want to keep my Drog Skull Captain alive in case I draw another Drog Skull Captain because this deck can't beat that, then that can help you inform decisions of like what to do in the mid game when you're when you're deciding a resource to give up or what to attack with or what order to play your threats out. So it, it's important to know this stuff for long term game planning. Another important thing to think about when picking up a new deck or eyeing a new deck is what is the deck's current position in the meta? Why or why not is the deck being played? So is the deck being played because there are new cards the meta can't keep up with? Is there all this new tech that people haven't figured out an answer for? Maybe there's not an answer for? Or perhaps the deck isn't being played because it's a tribal deck and Plague Engineer is just rampant everywhere and knocking cards out of the meta. Or maybe for some reason there's a lot of Soul Sisters or Life Gain around for whatever reason and Burn is just pushed down to that tier two status. God, a fate worse than death. It's. (laughs) Zach is speechless. Zach is emotional (laughs) right now. He's speechless. Yeah, he can't say anything. I've been reduced to my primal self and that is sobbing. I'd rather be turn four than turn two. I'm just saying. (laughs) Yeah, and sometimes meta position can even be determined because old cards get to attack the new tier zero. You know, I've been talking about GDS a lot and Stumber Denial, I think, fits that bill. Absolutely. And something to think about is, has a old deck come back to prominence because it may be a new printing of a card? Or maybe there's some sort of new boogeyman that an old deck is ready to come from obscurity to face. I, for one, welcome our new Soul Sister Overlords when Burn eventually overtakes us. And remember, I gave praise here on this show. <laughs> so in general, the meta is really shifting and it's hard to look at, you know, a meta snapshot and think how you fit in there. But in general, a deck is waning or rising because of something. It is not just the whims of players and the whims of some sort of greater things. So if a deck isn't doing good, it's time to think about that and why. Or if a deck is doing good, time to think about that and why and think about where you fit into this evolving scene. I think it's so important to realize that just because a deck has fallen out of the meta doesn't mean it's gone forever. And sometimes new technology can bring it back and improve its position. Something we saw very recently with Classic Affinity was Ginger Brute and All That Glitters were suddenly great new redundant copies of already powerful cards in that deck. And in my experience, Affinity wasn't seeing as much play in the last year or so. And then suddenly these cards emerged and I'm seeing screenshots from MTGO of 1010 Ginger Brutes that are suddenly unblockable carrying All That Glitters swinging for victory. Smash Out would be proud. I think one of the most important things that you have to understand about a deck too is what's your deck's role, right? We talked about the game plan and the sequencing and early, mid, late game understanding, position of the meta. But some people would say that 
the way you play a deck comes down to one question, and it's who's the beatdown. S- some people would say that. Mike F- Mike Flores would say that. I think many many people. No, I mean, no, I think that I think that that's a there's a reason that people still reference that article, yeah. right? I mean, it was written a long time yeah, ago. I think it was written ten or fifteen years ago, right? At least fifteen, I think. Yeah. And it's a it's a I question. I was in first grade. That's not true. That can't that doesn't add up actually. <laughs> yeah, so so the question of who's the beatdown also asks the question of who's the control. Because you can only one person can truly be the aggressor in a matchup, and the other person is essentially trying to control that aggression to turn the corner at some point, perhaps, and then they become the beatdown in the matchup. So who's the beatdown is not a single answer per deck. It can it can even be dynamic during the same game. But 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 Shane, what if I'm on burn and my opponent's on burn? Aren't we both the beatdown? I think it just depends on what the turn one and turn two plays look like, because then you're then you're looking at <gasps> or who goes first, even or who goes first, right? Then you're going to say, well, on turn if I'm on the draw in a burn matchup and they play turn one Goblin Guide, turn two Goblin Guide, and Monastery Swift Spear. I'm now the control. Right. <laughs> Those lightning bolts are going somewhere else suddenly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that it's important to kind of have a general understanding of what of the role your deck will take most of the time and then understand how to pivot into a different role. Are you an aggressive deck that will, like we just talked about, burn becomes the control in the classic burn versus affinity matchup? You're not going to see that as much right now, but burn has to control the aggression of affinity, for instance. Shane, don't you think sometimes this transition can even occur because of sideboarding? No, I think that's where it happens most often, right, Stan? Is because game one you're not going to be the best version of your aggressive deck or the best version of your control deck because you are playing against the field. When you know the matchup that you're playing after game one, you can then say, okay, do I need to go more controlling? Do I need to, know, do I need to go more aggressive? Do I need to become more disruptive by playing hate cards or silver bullet cards like we've talked about in the past? You have to also think about, again, what your plan is and then think about, am I diluting my plan? by playing the wrong sideboard cards or pulling in sideboard cards that seem like a good idea, but maybe aren't. Like Burn, for instance, has a really good chance of over-sideboarding, where you say, okay, I have these three or four Path to Exiles, and I think they would be really good against a deck like Humans because they have so many creatures. When in fact, more often than not, Burn's only going to be playing those Path to Exiles against really specific types of creatures that are just maybe too big for them to overcome, like maybe a Gurbag Angler deck or a Tarmogoyf deck or a Primeval Titan deck, where the creature is just so key to the other player executing their strategy that that's what that's in for. But if you were t- if you're taking away so much of your creatures or so uh, you know burn- important burn spells then that's really a dilution of your game, of your core strategy. Shane, I think you really hit on gold there. I actually want to extrapolate what you said real quick, because I think it helps with sideboarding in general, which is sometimes people look at their sideboard and go, against this deck, I don't even know what to bring in. But if you think of it less of, you know, my deck versus this deck, and more of what am I doing in the next round? What do I want my deck to do? It's easier to sideboard, right? Because if you go, well, I need to be the aggressor. Then you go, okay, then my two six drop payoffs maybe come out and I bring in these two more aggressive mid range cards and I can cut this removal because I don't really need that and I need this go fast card. So I think it's just super important, like you said, when you're sideboarding, you have to think the next game, what role am I playing? What am I doing? Because if you are thinking on sort of not that level two and level one, your opponent might just be going way past you and you're ready for a game that's not even happening. It's kind of a, am I doing more of the same? Do I need to switch things up? And I think that your sideboard oftentimes gives you the opportunity to do that. And you just have to play it smart. You know what I think is a little underrated? And please challenge me if you disagree. Are you going to say transformational sideboards? Transformational sideboards. No, I'm going to say something even better. Let's say you are, you just finished game one. You won. You've got a new deck. You're still figuring it out. And you're not sure how to sideboard. Just run back the original 60. How often do you think you do that? Shane, in a match. Man, run back to 60. That's a good question. I feel like if you're doing that, then you might be leaving some equity on the table because typically a sideboard is going to be designed to 
allow you to have some more game against many of the popular matchups. So there's probably always something you can do, but it's not always the case. I mean, I, I frequently do see good streamers just say something like, I'm just running it back. So one of the reasons why I think this is something that people maybe underrate is because to me, when I'm considering how to sideboard, and this is something I actually learned from Paulo Vito Damadarosa, which is first look at the cards in your 60 that are bad. Yeah. You know, start rather than what do I want to bring in, start with what do I want to take out? And I'm considering situations where it's unclear what I want to take out because I'm playing burn. My opponent is doing something weird and slow. I don't know what they're doing. I won game one really quickly. What's the point in trying something unexpected? Yeah. I mean, I think it's those kind of situations where I'm likely to do what you're saying, which is like if I'm an aggressive deck and I ran someone over, keep going. Don't don't stop. Right. I I, uh, I totally agree with that. I think I probably run back the original 60. I don't know, 10 percent of the time, a little, little more than that, maybe maybe 15 percent of the time. Cool. I typically only will if they concede before I know their plan. Yeah, but you play decks that adapt a lot after after sideboarding. You know, like you tend to play mid-range decks where you want to really tweak in. Do I want to get a little bit bigger? Do I want to get a little bit smaller? Not every deck has that ability. Sure, fair enough. A lot of decks, as we'll talk about shortly, have a lot of room for hate cards or silver bullets. And when you have those, it's harder to adapt into in your strategy. So you know what else I think is a little underrated? When people are picking up a popular deck, something that's, you know, in the meta tier one, for lack of a better tier, I don't think people spend enough time thinking about what they're going to do in the mirror. You know, you're new to a deck and you might get matched against someone who isn't new to the same deck. And this might be a place where external resources really come in handy, actually, and looking at people's sideboard guides or articles and trying to take your learning of a deck a step above is figuring out what are other people doing when they're facing off in mirror matches. So the the last question I think, which is important to ask yourself when determining your deck's role, is understanding whether you're playing to the board or playing to the stack. And if you're doing one or the other, assess what you're doing against other strategies that are doing the opposite. So let's say you're on Storm, which is a deck that plays to the stack, figuring out how you're going to deal with damping sphere or other things that are clogging the board state that make it harder for you to execute your plan, knowing how to interact with the zone of play that you're not operating under, I think is something that you have to ask yourself whether you're building a sideboard or whether you're figuring out what to do with your 75. I think the, the last thing to think about uh, when you're trying to evaluate what you're, how to pick up a new deck is really keeping in mind what your deck can lose to. And this is especially important uh, for decks that have specific pieces of synergy they're trying to pull off at the start like there are plenty of combo decks that just die to certain pieces of hate so you need to be aware when you're going into game two with the way that that's gonna happen one huge piece of uh, of technology that will be brought in against people quite often is blood moon and so keep in mind if your deck is something that is really vulnerable to Blood Moon for some reason, whether that's because you have a greedy mana base or something else, because that is a surefire way to leave yourself open to a quick game two loss is if you weren't thinking enough that your opponent might bring in Blood Moon against you. I I just disagree. I, I think you should always fetch for the mana you want. And you should live the life you want to live. And don't let some old boomer tell you not to. I've definitely played games where blood moon was a real possibility and like my only my only no. out was mm-hmm. something like a deputy of detention in from the side and i just didn't sideboard it in because i just didn't think about it and you can you can there's plenty of cards that if you don't have a hate piece or a way to get off the board you just can't win through and i think you you have to be cognizant of those because if you're not then like dave said you're just gonna punt away a game yeah, but I, I think that the bigger point here, too, is when you think that someone has brought in a piece of hate against you, you have to craft your game plan differently. Like, you have to start thinking about how do I win when this piece of hate is out against me from the very beginning, right? Mm-hmm. You can't change your plan after someone plays rule of law against you if you're on Storm, right? But maybe you can find a way to get off an early value, empty the Warrens in game two, so you get six or eight goblins online before they can rule of law. And then you have a way to win still, even though even if they do play their hate piece. So you have to think about both what you lose to, but also how you win through the things uh, that you lose to. 
I, I think here it's worth mentioning that not all hate is created equal, right? And there's a difference between something like a braid and something like stony silence or surgical extraction versus in rest in peace, where one is a one and done and the other feels like a silver bullet that left unanswered shuts off a strategy entirely. So knowing the difference between whether you have to worry about silver bullets or whether you have to worry about just like brief points of interaction can also help you figure out how to play through your opponent's hate and your opponent's sideboard plans. And maybe likewise your opponent has anti-silver bullet cards. Veil of Summer, only legal and modern, does that. Dive down and pioneer maybe one day? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> by them Not now with the denial in the format my hope for dive down was that the next uh eternal format would be post stubborn denial including dive down and that just did not happen well what if your creatures don't have four power or more dive down starting to look a little better a little better then yeah my goal for this format was to be the first person to 5-0 with a place that have dive down in their 75 <laughs> not there yet but we'll get there folks <laughs> So, you know, we've looked at all the different things to consider when you are picking up a new deck. We've looked at um, methods for learning. We've looked at ways to evaluate the cards, the plan that you have, and also all the exceptions that kind of work off of the plan that you have, the meta, the deck's position in the meta. Um, I think it's interesting to kind of remember that all of this really ladders up to one thing, which is make sure that you understand how your deck is more than just a pile of cards. This because is every deck has some kind of, of synergy that makes it more than that. When I meditate every night, and I'm repeating my mantra, which I will not repeat on the air, I'm usually thinking about what makes my deck a deck and not a trade binder that's sleeved up and in a deck box. And you should think about that too. And don't ask me about my mantra. That's, that's deep, Stan. Thanks, I, I wrote the notes. When we started making this episode, I don't think we set out to do a comprehensive guide on mastering new decks, but I feel like we may have accidentally stumbled upon something a little bit more comprehensive than what we usually do, because there are so many different intricacies to learning decks that people often don't talk about, because so much discourse is about specific decks and what specific decks are trying to do. And when you can determine questions that can be asked about a variety of strategies. I think that's when you can be a more holistically better magic player, whether you like modern or pioneer, or you want to get better at drafting, or you're interested in standard because you play on arena. These are lessons that translate across formats and across time. And I think this is the type of episode that, let's say you want to pick up something new and you're not sure where to begin. This is the type of episode that you might want to remember down the line and say, hey, there's this new three mana planeswalker that's ravaging the format that got printed in lair of the behemoth or whatever bookmark it put it in time capsule put it in your dream journal mail it to your mom give it to your aunt spread it all around so next time you pre-order cards because you know archmage's charm belongs in blue moon but you've never played blue moon before ask these questions while you pick up your new deck and you can be that person who's the end boss on week one and then you can share your prize packs with us and we'll take him. Well, we'll take it all. We're we're not we're not picky. I'll take any card. At twenty one twenty one, dive down lane, Chicago, Illinois, PO Box Z A. That's me. But with that, that's going to wrap up this week's show. If you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you get the latest episodes as soon as they come out. And if you use Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and review. If you'd like to submit a question to the podcast or really pick our brains on anything in modern or pioneer, tweet us at the dive down. That's all one word or email thedivedown at gmail.com. And if you want to support the show, you can go ahead and join our Patreon. Joining at any tier gets you access to the super secret Slack channel, where we love interacting with our fans and patrons. And that's patreon.com slash thedivedown. Also, shout out to manatraders.com for sponsoring the Dive Down. Sign up for Mana Traders using promo code thedivedown, all one word, for 15% off your first three months of writing paper or magic online cards. And as always, special thanks to the bands Nowhere and Spaceblood for letting us use their music. And until next week, get out there and master new decks!
I'm, I'm setting you up with that question. Well, it's called an alley oop, Shane. Sure. He missed the lane. Yeah, I think you can do it. I think that there. <laughs> you can do it. You got. Oh you got it. Everyone, let's let's clap for Shane. 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 Shane